slabs, two walls, V-shaped, and it just covers his life and all of his accomplishments and uh, multi-medal winner. And But that took two years from putting out a request for artists, artist designs, models, measuring, getting feedback from the public, uh, back and forth with the commission as to, well, we like this, no, we don't like that. And then we turn it all into the city council and the city council can say, yeah, no, we don't like it. We don't want it after all. Mm -hmm. But fortunately they, they chose to go with it. So that was good. Wonderful. But that's what I do. Yeah, I, I, I sit on the commission for the cultural arts. It's a four year term, it's all volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's an opportunity to give back to the city. And you know, I, I didn't know anything about parking or traffic. I didn't want to get involved with some of the social stuff. I hadn't really, I'm not qualified to make those decisions for some, for many people, but cultural arts, yeah. I had an idea as to what things might be pleasant for the community to enjoy. So a lot of the statues and bronze pieces and artwork city will continue to put up is what our commission does. Very cool. Yeah. Well, we have about um, one more minute and we'll be getting formally started for those of you who are um, trickling in. Um, we're just um, kind of shooting the breeze right now, so. <laughs> Shooting. Okay, and it's two o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so we are so excited to have Octavio Cesar Martinez with us today. Um, and it's sponsored by the Arts and Culture Committee at Blue Mountain Community College. As many of you know, we have an annual festival um, in the spring, but we were unable to have it this year because of COVID-19. So um, we are just kind of starting to get in gear for being able to have online um, events instead. So we're really excited to have this one today. Um, and um, Oct Octavio Cesar Martinez is an author, speaker, and development consultant, and he has spoken internationally. Um, he's been a corporate um, account executive and sales analyst with a major telecommunication company. I can barely read my handwriting here, so I apologize. But, <laughs> um, but interestingly, he's also been a religious leader. Um, he was a chaplain with the LAPD, is that correct? LA, LA County Sheriff's and, and Whittier PD, yeah. Okay, and um, some other interesting occupations like that. So, um, so we're really excited to hear about your story. Um, before we uh, get started, I'd like to, um, show some guidelines. So please leave your audio and video off until the open question and answer times. Um, I, I, I asked you to raise your hand in the participant box if you would like to ask a question audibly, but actually I don't know if we have a little raise your hand um, icon on our Zoom room today. So um, maybe you could do like a, uh, a thumbs up or a clap if you would like um, to ask a question and we'll try to keep our eyes on that during the open Q&A times. Um, if you would rather not be recorded because we're recording this session, you can also ask any questions that you have in the chat box and our very own Bruce Kaus will be monitoring that. Um, so we'll be sure to see your questions. Um, our tentative schedule for today, um, introductions, which we've already begun a little bit. Um, I've asked Octavio to read some excerpts from his book, especially for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it. Uh, we'll have a Q&A open to the audience. Um, if we have a lull in that Q&A, I have some questions from my students and myself that I'd love to ask, and then we'll open it up to the audience again. So it should not take more than an hour today, maybe a little less than an hour is what we're anticipating. And just a reminder for any students who are attending for credit, um, be sure to follow your instructor's guidelines for receiving credit. We will not be taking attendance during the session today. So I would recommend that you take notes and ask questions and that will help ensure your engagement that you get the most out of the session as well. Um, and I'm gonna stop screen sharing in just a minute, but um, these are some, in case you happen to have the book, I asked Octavio to read um, from some of these, from these pages that are on the screen, if you care to follow along. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead you know what? Hang on a second. Let me make sure I have those 16 okay. through 17. <laughs> because I just to make 16 through 17, or was it? Uh, I think it was 18, 19. Oh, okay. But uh, so good thing I asked 33 and 34. Hold on a second. 
Boy, I'm, I'm looking like a student here. Hold on. Yeah, well, that's good. You're doing a good job. Okay, let's see here. 33, 34, and uh, 130, end of chapter. Okay. So do you want me just to read with, and then maybe pause for anybody who has some feedback or just keep Sure, keep reading? yeah, yeah, pausing would be great. Um, okay. Thank you. Great. Well, first of all, hey, thanks for having me. I've, I've known Sherry, goodness, is it going on 12 years? Yeah, maybe it could be 15, actually. I was just thinking about this morning. Wow, <laughs> for quite a while. So um, thanks for having me. Let me go ahead and read from um, the book here, the first opening. This is the opening chapter. It's the entire chapter, actually. It's entitled Unforgettable. The first beating I can recall rocked the hell out of me. He crashed his fist into my jaw with such force that it knocked me off my feet, and I would have collapsed, but he held me up by my shirt. And before I could process what happened, I was hit again, and again, and again. And I tried to stop this humiliation by holding up my hands, but that was a futile attempt to defend myself. He was stronger and taller and trained as a boxer, so I was outmatched. I saw his giant fist coming at my jaw. He had the thick, meaty fingers of a man who worked with his hands all his life. But the most vivid thing I can recall is his gold pinky ring. It was custom made, a simple gold ring with his initials OGM. One blow landed on my rib cage, it took the air out of me. I couldn't breathe for a few seconds, so I didn't cry. My face felt hot, my ears were ringing. But when I was able to breathe again, then I did start to cry. He stopped. He let go of my shirt. I was winded and hurt all over. My knees buckled and I fell down. I noticed a button was torn off my shirt and another was undone. I pulled myself up and stumbled to bed. He straightened up and walked away. He was 34. I was seven. He was my father. I was his son. And it was a beautiful day when my father died. So it was, uh, that was meant to be a bit of a hook. If, if, if any of you are wondering about the quote, the craft of writing, I was thinking, how do you start a story like this? And um, it was deliberate in that sense, but it also becomes a, a bookend because at the end of the book, I, I pay a tribute to my dad as to what an amazing guy he really was. And so it, like, my story is the vehicle that carries the idea of forgiveness and, and that kind of thing. But the opening is meant to hopefully, either people put the book down or they just wanna keep reading it at that point. So that's what I've heard from folks who, who uh, got the book. Anybody have a feedback or a comment here while we're yeah, do we have any questions at this point so far? All right, well, I'm gonna, I'll just keep going. Okay. Uh, so pages 10 through 12. My father was many things to many people, but I remember him as a triple A dad, alcoholic, abuser, adulterer, and all of this stingily crossed my threshold. I hated him. I had been on the business end of his beatings more than once. On at least two occasions, I went to school with visible bruises and bandages. I thought, what an awful thing I must be that my own father would beat me. But years later, I understood there's nothing a skinny boy could do to deserve a beating dealt out by a grown man. Even now I can see his left fist coming at my jaw. And even now I can see his angry face. Who deserves a memory like that? I was afraid of him. Physical wounds are one thing. They're easy to deal with. You can treat them, you can ice them, you can bandage them, and in time they'll heal. But the unseen wounds are a real bitch, like little black holes sucking all the light and life out of your soul until they finally consume you, consume you completely, your heart, your soul, your mind. Bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, they suffocated my ability to give or experience love in any healthy way. And it left me a walking corpse trying to breathe. And that was only part of the problem. Hurt is not sustainable. My hurt morphed into anger and then my anger morphed into contempt. And that's where I held my father for many years in contempt. Past the hurt, past the anger, I held him in contempt for years. When my father died, it was a beautiful day in Los Angeles. It was July 2nd, 2004. Yeah, boy, still a pretty vivid day in my mind. 
the, the truth is what's funny i was running um i was uh, one of the teaching pastors at a church and my brother called to say my dad had died and i remember responding automatically like a chaplain oh, i'm sorry for your loss since he had been dead to me emotionally for so many years, his, his uh, physical passing really meant nothing at the time. But it, um, when people ask me about the title of the book, um, I can tell that they haven't read the book because they'll say something like, uh, oh, so you had a very beautiful time with your father as he was passing or something. No. Or um, there was this great moment of reconciliation when he passed away. No. There are three levels of that title, and the first one is just simply that it was a beautiful day in Los Angeles, low 70s, nice breeze, blue sky. The other part of it is that I remember thinking I was just glad that he died, to be very truthful. I was, I actually thought, finally, good. But the last part of it, and this is the most significant part, is that that was when the pivot occurred. That's when in my 40s, everything regarding, um, how broken I was and how broken he was uh, came to a head and I was able to uh, step into a place of forgiveness towards him. And actually it was empathy first, not pity, empathy. Like, yeah, okay, you didn't wanna be this guy because I didn't wanna be that guy. And people gave me a lot of breaks and you know, I should have done this for you a long time ago, but yeah. Well, one of my um, one of my students during our um, our book discussions this term asked mm -hmm. the following question, kind of going back to where you said when you heard that your father had died, you said, "I'm sorry for your loss," and you mm -hmm. didn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. So, one of my students asked, while reading, "I wondered how Martin Martinez dealt with all of his anger and hate towards his father. How, what did he do to manage it, especially when he was beaten constantly?" And as a kid, oh, that's not the question, sorry. Okay. <laughs> How did Martinez not have any emotion towards his father's death? He talked so highly of him at the beginning of the book. How did he not think about those good times as a kid when thinking of his father when he died? Yeah, well, because, uh, by the way, I gave this manuscript to a couple of therapists before I published it because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't violating a therapeutic idea or principle. and. Here's the reality. When, when, when someone is upset or in pain or angry, now let me go back a little bit. I don't want to sound that highfalutin. Have you ever not liked somebody and no matter what they do, it, it makes you mad. Like you see this person sitting there just having lunch and you go, look at them eating that sandwich like an animal. And they're just sitting there having their sandwich. You know, When you don't like somebody, you see them through that lens, everything about them is bad with our family or people that we care about, the ones that have more access to us, our hearts and our souls, uh, it, 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 it'll actually, I think, as in my case, and I've seen in others, it just wipes out all the memories that were positive and all you have are memories of what it's horrible. And on another level, it was also a way for me to feel morally superior to my father. I didn't wanna think of anything he did that was remotely good I didn't want to remember all the years that he worked hard, did what he did. I mean, he was extravagant with his gift giving. And uh, it, it's none of that was on my mind or could I, I couldn't even recall it. It was just all I could think about is what a horrible person he was. And that's where I kept it for decades. Yeah, yeah. wish I could tell you was a better person at that time, but I just wasn't, you know. Well, I'm on page 19, so let me go ahead here. I think I'm going to be 19 to 20. On July 7, 2004, I officiated my father's funeral. It was like other funerals. I had officiated before and since. There's a deceased. There's a coffin. There are friends and family members in various states of grief and disbelief. Often I would be so affected by the grief of others that I would weep with them. My father's funeral was a carbon copy, except for one thing. I didn't care. No emotion, none. My dad's actions, everything he was, completely and absolutely dulled my heart to him. My emotional energy was needed and better spent elsewhere in my busy life than on him. So I settled for not giving a damn, which ended up closing down an important part of my heart, which I'll always need. But you can never just choke off a part of your heart. Eventually, all of it dies, slowly, 
but it dies. While he was in the hospital, he asked to see me, and I didn't go. Now keep in mind, when you're a pastor or a chaplain, hospital visits are part of the deal. You get a call, you go. Any hour of the day and night, you go. But I didn't go see my father as he lay on his deathbed. I didn't want to go. And as far as I knew then, he died alone, and I didn't care. At my father's funeral, people came to me and offered their condolences. Grown men with moist eyes would tell me all the ways my father had helped them get jobs, restore relationships, on and on it went. Uncles, aunts, cousins from Mexico were there. Local family was there too. They shared their favorite memories of my father. Each one would break down, experience grief and weep. And when they did, I did what I had done many times before, except this time I felt nothing. I replied, I'm sorry for your loss. Well, you know, when I read that, I think I was a real idiot. I was just a horrible human being. Um, but that is, that is actually what happened. Yeah. So um, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Okay. Um, one is, did, did you have um, other siblings who were also beaten? Uh, yes, I had other siblings. I have an older sister and a younger brother. There's three of us three years apart. They did not receive the heavy hand that I did. And part of it is, as I mentioned in the book, I'm, I'm a, a, almost a carbon copy of my father. Mm -hmm. Personality, resemblance, actions, everything, everything. And I think there is there is a bit of guilt transference as my father didn't like certain things about himself. He saw them in me. There was that anger. And then, as I pointed out also in the book with my mother, there was whatever issue she had with my dad, you know, I was just a younger version walking into the house and would sometimes catch it. So it was just a, a, an unfortunate set of circumstances that uh, mm. became the target for both of their frustrations. Mm -hmm. And then we have another question, um, which I was gonna ask you a little later, but we can certainly talk about it now. Okay. Um, could you perhaps share any cultural aspects related to your experiences in terms of your um, Mexican heritage, et cetera? <laughs> yeah, you, you mean as far as the some of the violence or just some of the family stuff? I think just um, because we do have a lot of um, second generation immigrant and immigrant right. students here at BMCC. And so we'd right. love to hear kind of more, more of that side yeah. of the story as well. Okay. Well, um, my family, my mother and father, I, and I think back at this because of my travels internationally, they came to uh, the States in the early 50s as illegal immigrants. So here's a, a two young people in their early 20s. They leave their country. They leave their culture. They move to a different country where they don't speak the language. It wasn't necessarily friendly to Hispanics either. This is, this is, less than 10 years after World War II and the Zoot Suit Wars in Los Angeles. And so it wasn't especially friendly to newcomers and certainly not to illegals. My mother would tell me stories about my dad trying to get home from work and taking the wrong bus because he couldn't read the directions or, uh, you know, he started as a dishwasher as a lot of men would, just manual labor. And he stayed in that industry and he retired as a, a French sous chef but uh, my mother was working in a, in a sewing factory. Um, after my sister was born, my mother lost two girls before I was born. So there's two sisters that I have. You might say that I've never met. Um, and they, they were just poor, you know, living in the, a bedroom of a friend until they got their own little place. And we rented a little duplex in Huntington Park, which is a suburb outside of Los Angeles. And I remember the sense of accomplishment. I mean, even without saying it, I understood that when my parents bought their first house, that was a big deal. Then as young kids going back to Mexico, because that's what you do every vacation is just going back to Mexico to see family, to see where my mother had grown up, to see where my father grew up. I mean, dirt floors, uh, outhouses for the bathrooms. I mean, um, bucket showers. I mean, it was, it was hard to relate to their life. And as an adult, I still necessarily can't, but I understand how they must have felt like they had arrived. They had bought a home, 
My dad got a new car every two years. You know, life was pretty good. We were, I would say, middle class, you know, which was way rich compared to the, all the family. I do recall thinking that we had gotten the golden ticket because had my family, my mom and dad stayed in Mexico, we would have been raised there in that poverty. My mother had a sixth grade education. My father, I think, finished high school and bounced around a few colleges and never finished anything. So who knows? I mean, I, I'm just thinking, who knows what would have happened to us? Who? But a lot of the uh, spankings, you know, there's that uh, cultural joke in, in, in with Hispanics about the chancla, you know, being hit with a shoe. I remember thinking, a shoe? A shoe would have been kind, you know. <laughs> Everything was a weapon in the house. I mean, heaven forbid you got in trouble in the garage because there's power tools and hammers there, you know. Uh, so there's there's some of that. I can look back at that now with some laughter and, and comedy because let's face it, in the end, all pain is comedy. But uh, back then, it just it just was it was difficult. And I my my mother and father must have had their own struggles and challenges in their marriage they're raising three kids they're you know just life in general you know yeah um a couple couple other questions on the chat um how were you able to overcome your um ex your experiences with your father and your mother um the abusive experiences and has it ever impacted you in life, either positively or negatively? Um, the answer to the last question is yes, both positive and negative. Uh, but I'll address that, uh, the first part of your question. How did I overcome it? Um, I've, I've talked about forgiveness for the last decade plus with people, and I've made it a point to try to understand the mechanics that you don't have to be religious. It is a virtue if you study philosophy or look at uh, character development. Um, if you're religious, let's say you're, you participated in one of the Abrahamic faiths of Islam or Judaism or Christianity, whatever flavor that you have in those, you're taught that you should practice it. I think the problem is that people have been taught incorrectly as to what it is. And so I made it a point to try to figure that out. But the first step, the first thing is recognizing you are no different then you're offender, period. And when I had that epiphany that my, that my father was just as broken as me or that I was just as broken as my father, what, however you, know, you phrase it, except that I was fortunate that I had a couple of male friends who uh, cared enough to call me out. Like, bro, what you're doing here is not healthy. It, there's some, you know, you're, you're pulling some shit that's really not good. Look what you're doing to your family. Look what you're doing to yourself. And I, I realized that I was on a, on a track to become another statistic. So in my mid twenties or so, I had an epiphany where I pivoted and then I uh, rebuilt my life from work, health. I mean, I actually bought books on how to, how to manners, how to behave. I mean, I was an animal. So um, I made it a point to I guess, rebuild myself to be a member of society. But the final closing phase, that, that, by the way, that was just getting rid of some violent temper. I didn't get to the place of forgiving my dad till my late forties. And I was active in a church. And it's really surprising how you can have such glaring blind spots. You can clearly see somebody else's problem and miss your own. And so this is why it, I think it's, helpful to have friends that are willing to uh, willing for you to be angry with them or break off friendship to tell you this is not good what you're doing and here's some hope. Um, another question in the chat, did you, did you ever try to seek help as a kid with doctors, police, or even family members? Or did you oh. feel that Oh, or did you feel that because this is something that was only happening to you, you had to deal with it alone? Yeah, this is, remember, I grew up in the 60s. So it's not like today where, you know, kids are encouraged to turn their parents in like it's some sort of new youthful Stasi or something. 
you know, heaven forbid you didn't get cereal right. Oh, my parents are abusive, you know, turn them in. Uh, I, I'm halfway joking about that. But back then, um, I, I think there was, no, I never thought of ever saying anything, you know, in a weird way, in a very strange way. I thought that something was wrong with me. So why would I tell somebody about some, like, why would I tattle or, or, you know, get my parents in trouble when it would end up that I would end up being the one that was really in trouble. So it never even occurred to me to talk to anybody about what was going on in the household, to be frank. Yeah, not even once. You mentioned that after getting beat up one time, um, you showed up at school with a, a band, with some bandaging and the nurse saw you and she mm -hmm. didn't say any there. She said, I don't remember what she said, but one of my students commented on that was like, why, why did the nurse not do anything? Yeah, I don't think there was anything in place. I, it, I, I realize it, it seems shocking and irresponsible, but I will say this to that student and to people in general, it is never um, helpful to judge people in the past based on your current sensibilities. Like somebody thinks, oh, this was happened 100 years ago. How could that have happened? Because at that time, that made sense. At that time, that's, you know, it, if you wish to think that somehow you would have done something different, you're only fooling yourself. That was the culture. We've had reformers and people, individuals who, whether it was women's rights or slavery or whatever it might be, who spoke out against the culture and said, hey, you know, this is not healthy. This is not right. This is not morally right. We should make a change. And that's remarkable. But it, you know, I think it's um, it's uh, a bit dishonest and it feels good to claim and think I would have never done what somebody did. Think about this. This is now going on 60 years ago. Yeah, maybe you would have. And perhaps she didn't see it as, as a big danger at the time. But here's my, here's my challenge to some of these folks who think that in 60 and 100 years from now, when your grandchildren are looking back at your life, when they look at your, our music, the way that we dress, the technology that we had, and some of the ideas that we hold so important, I wonder how many of them are gonna stand the test of time. I really do, you know? Um, I don't think a lot of it will. Do we have um, any more questions at this point or shall we keep going with the readings? Can I give a shout out to somebody I just saw right now? Sure, yeah. Tim Robertson is my publisher. And oh, hi, he, Tim. He, he graciously came to listen to this and here's a guy that's been exposed to this story as much as I have. So Tim, thank you for the support. That's really sweet of you to be here. <laughs> uh, I think I'm supposed to read 33 through 34. So um, <laughs> you don't mind. Let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> I loved and still love the Catholic Church, the church with all its mystery and majesty, the smell of incense, the sound of sh the shoes made on the marbled floors, the art, the feel of the wood, and the sounds of my smock as I walked. And I learned to take it seriously because of my father. He was so strong and so big in my eyes, so when he kneeled and prayed, I noticed. Who was God that my dad would bend his knee and pray to him? What did my dad know that I did not? I can see his face, the profile of his face as he prayed, his eyes darting back and forth, never closed, always open when he prayed. And he prayed silently to himself. Hang on a second. <clears throat> so I never heard my father pray. I, I'd see his lips move with his eyes open, looking up, looking back and forth. And I wonder if he ever found what he was looking for. <laughs> it's funny. I've read this, I don't know, a million times. It'll still sometimes surprise me with a little bit of emotion. Yeah, I, I, I'm grateful for my mom and dad because, um, I mean, to this day, I can, I can, I can, I can still see him praying. Um, he wore a suit to church. Um, you know, it, it leaves an imprint 
when you see your dad do whatever it's going to he does you know and uh whether it's working or being that guy or you know a, an act of violence but as i understood when i got older he didn't want to be that guy and i think at church he was looking for redemption i hope he found it i trust he did but he took church seriously and that's where i learned to take it seriously even if i was even if i was frustrated and wasn't changing as fast as i thought i should i realized that that was the only place for at least uh, for me that i was going to find that help and uh, that's because of my dad yeah so don't know if anybody has another comment or question because of that uh well it, it, i don't know if it was related to that but um was I, I find this question interesting because you mentioned in the book how you became violent as a as a boy and a young man. Yeah. Um, but the question is, was your father violent towards others besides you? <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, it's it's funny how uh, I and this is going to be a very broad brush, but I remember almost a sense of pride that my mother talked about my dad when somebody gave him crap. There was apparently a fight he got into as a young man in a, in in one of the kitchens he worked at as a cook, and the uh, the the charge was that he had used a weapon when he uh, broke this guy's jaw and skull. No, nope, it's just my dad's fist. He knew how to throw a punch, and so uh, so I don't think she ever was unsure that my dad could protect us if something went wrong. I remember one time somebody molested or did something to my sister at Savon's. We were standing in line for ice cream. This is back before it was called Osco. And uh, my sister told my dad, I guess, as we just got home from getting ice cream, he was so lit up. We got back in the car, he went looking for him. And I, I'm grateful that my dad didn't find that guy. He probably would have killed him. So uh, my dad did not back down from a fight. And some of it was some of it was also his sense of what's right and wrong, which I, I can imagine a lot of the things he did must have tormented him because he was acting inappropriately. But he was a very affectionate, emotional man. What he did not have was control over his emotions. And that was his downfall. Um, another question. Um... I have a friend who was assaulted by her father. He used to pray to God for forgiveness. And as an adult, she became an atheist. Did mm -hmm. you retain your faith? Oh yeah. Yeah. That was never, that was never lost. Um, Sherry knows this story. A couple, um, Tim does. The, um, I, I was raised Catholic till I was about 11. I went to seminary to become a priest. And while at seminary, I had a very powerful experience that caused me to think I'll never be good enough. And so I was so disillusioned because for me, the church was, um, well, to use a modern term, it was a safe place. I loved everything about it. I still do. And became active in a Protestant for 45 plus years, 10 of those years as a pastor, which makes my behavior more shitty because I knew better <laughs> than, uh, uh, but so, you know, went to uh, a Protestant university, earned a degree in philosophy and theology and art um, in my 50s. Uh, in 2015, I resigned from the ministry. 2016, I returned to the Catholic Church, which is where I've been since, and very content. I, the idea of believing in God certainly has colored and textured me, not as much as I wish, but I, I, um, I think there are reasons to believe. If, if some of you remember the uh, TV show, The X-Files, uh, one of my favorite TV shows, there's a character there, Fox Moeller, and in his office, there was a poster with a spaceship. And on the bottom of the, of the, of the poster, it said, I want to believe. And I recall thinking, that's exactly my story. Um, I do. I'm completely content to believe in, 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 a, in God. I want to believe in him and I find reasons to do so as well. 
Okay, another question. Did your dad ever try to push the reasons why he was abusive onto something else or come up with excuses? Did he ever explain why he did it? No. No. Um, no. Uh, in, in, in hindsight, as an adult and, note, and remembering my behavior when I was embarrassed or over a, an outburst, he avoided, he left the house, he went to work. And then a day or two would pass and, you know, the emotions would settle down and it was kind of back to normal. But I recall thinking I never was certain when the next blow up would come. So there was a little bit of eggshells. And, but then thinking that, oh, this is all outside and he's a horrible man and my mom's a horrible person. Once I left the house and got married on my own, I realized that trigger was inside me as well. I was never sure when I might act out and, you know, <laughs> it happened a few times and, you know, getting into a street brawl or chasing somebody in my car. What, what people call road rage now was like, I would call Wednesdays, you know, it was just, it, was just, it just happens. Um, yeah. Jeez, oh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I know that those things happen, but it's hard to remember. Like, gosh, I was really that guy. I mean, even the story about the ta tattoos of my hands—they had so many scars. I broke bones by throwing a punch wrong. Um, just it was just my stupidity. Excuse me, the viol the anger manifested in violence and stupidity. And so, as I say the story in the book, uh, that's why I put the, the tattoos on my hands, love wins, because they were telling a different story for the longest time. So now that I'm older, a little less piss and vinegar, and the grace of God, uh, I have a different story on my hands. Lovely, I was gonna ask you about the tattoos. I, I haven't seen you since you got those, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I got them very late in life. I remember when, when I drove up to the tattoo parlor, Lily didn't know where we were going. And she said, oh, you're going to get tattoos? I go, do you think I'm worried about my parents? Or I'm going to regret them when I get older? I mean, I'm already old. <laughs> my parents are gone, so it's OK. <laughs> OK, a couple more questions here. OK. Um, is there anything, any specific scripture in the Bible that you like or kept keep in mind to keep you going? Yeah, Joel uh, chapter 2. 24, 25, about the, the Lord restoring the years that the locusts had eaten. And of course, Romans, the idea that in chapter eight, all things work together for good. Not that all things are good, but they can work out for good. Um, the story of Jerusalem being rebuilt because it was rebuilt by the rubble of, of their mess. And that's what's happened. Um, yeah, I, I, I wish a lot of things had not happened. I, I wish I had become a different person, but I'm grateful for, for who I am. And, in, and instead of regretting or hating all the things that did happen, it's as if the good Lord chose to use all that mess to make me into a different person. So yeah, those, those scriptures out of Joel, Romans 8, and um, the Old Testament in general. Um, well, kind of related to something you just said, um, okay. if you could change anything, what would it be? My height. I wanted to be taller, <laughs> play a little basketball. <laughs> uh, I, I would, I would, I would come back as George Clooney or Cary Grant. Other than that, uh, everything else in my life is perfect. No, I, I don't know. How do you answer those questions? It, it, with all due respect to the person who asked the question, you don't get a chance to change your shit. It, it, it is. Your story is your story. The parents you have are the parents you have. The, the things you did wrong are the things you did wrong. Your jail time is your jail time. Your history is your history. The thing to remember is that you don't have to be defined by that. Um, when people say you can be anything you want to be, I think we all know that's not true. I mean, I, I was never going to be a world-class athlete. Um, I was never going to be an astronaut. That's not for maybe the lack of opportunity or, or training. It's just that I'm not built that way. So the trick is to find out how you are built, what matters to you, what, what are you possibly good at that you could turn into a real talent or a strength. Um, I've often told people, you know, you, know, you wanna have a hobby that 
that maybe makes a little money for you, but a hobby that you just plain enjoy. So as Sherry knows and others have known, I, when I took up painting, it was, first of all, I didn't realize it was a teachable skill and I learned it. So if you wish to do something different, try it. You know, I want to play the piano. You want to learn how to fly an airplane. You should try it. I think that's the benefit of going to college is that you get exposed to different ideas and, uh, and people and viewpoints. And you might discover, wow, I really love doing this. It doesn't necessarily pay money, but I really have a sense of contentment and joy from it. And if I can make a living from it, that's terrific. When I was in the sixth grade, when I was in junior high, when I was in high school, I was told that I should write and you're a storyteller. And then I took multiple assessments in my career and always came out to the idea of, of telling stories or speaking and I never paid attention to it. I was too busy working, raising a family, trying to keep my life together. And since leaving full-time work, I was able to write and had a little success at it. I'm here now talking about it. So you never know what, what, the, what your journey will lead you into. Um, try different things till you find the thing that you enjoy doing. There are a couple more questions, but I wanted to ask one that I had for you before I forget. Okay. Um, you mentioned going to college, and I know you went back to college later in life, and we have a lot of um, non-traditional students who um, have gone back to school later in life. Um, what was that like for you? <laughs> I found out what an arrogant son of a bitch I was because I had very little patience for uh, my, my, my peers. Uh, because they were teenagers and I was in my fifties. And, uh, you know, a philosophy is a lot of discussion. And, and sometimes uh, someone is pontificating about their view of Aristotle or why Epictetus was wrong. And I, I, I just, I'd have, to, I'd have to roll my eyes privately. Like who cares what you think? You're only 18, you haven't done anything with your life. So all apologies to 18 year olds on this call. Um, so I, I realized, boy, I really need to work on my arrogance. That is, that is a terrible trait. It's probably choking off some other virtue. So it was awkward. It was embarrassing. It was weird. The first year, um, almost every class for the first two years, people thought I was the professor, not a student. And then I, uh, I only had one professor in four years. It was older than me. And uh, let's see what else was different about it. But you know what, I tell you what, though, by the end of that fourth year, and, and I wasn't even going to graduate, I mean, I was graduating, I wasn't going to walk, and a friend encouraged me to walk saying, you know, it, it, it's a big deal, you should do it, you accomplished it, da 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 da. And so I did, I didn't, I was surprised to find out how emotional it was for me. Um, yeah, I, I got to love those guys, there was 10 of us in, in my philosophy cohort. And I miss those guys, I love them. We're all friends on Facebook and I see them growing up and getting married and starting their careers. And uh, I'm just grateful that I got a chance to meet these guys when they were just putting together their lives. That's awesome. Well, let's go back to some more um, questions in the chat. Um, okay. One is, do you have any kids of your own, which you've mentioned a little bit? Um, mm -hmm. If you do, um, how did you break the story to them about your father? <laughs> Well, here's a fun fact. None of them have read the book. Uh, I, I, about back in the days when you could walk in, walk in public without a mask, I was visiting my son and his wife and uh, our, my granddaughters and we were taking a walk. I was talking about the book and how a lot of the, the book parties and things were canceled for the year. And somehow the subject came up about reading the book and my oldest son said to me, Pops, I don't wanna read that. I mean, I went through it. I don't want to remember Poppy. That was how they called their grandfather. I don't want to remember Poppy that way. I don't want to remember you being a little kid, being beat up. I just, it's, I prefer not to read it. So they didn't. And my brother and sister also chose not to read it. Uh, I sent them copies. I said, hey, this is your father as well. And just as a, as a side note, I, I, I didn't write the book to say my dad was a horrible human being and you should join me in hating him. I wrote the book to say, I was a horrible human being and don't do what I did. But here's why I, I 
here's what happened, you know? So um, I do have two sons and a daughter. Um, my, my oldest son owns a small IT business. He's successful. My second son is an account executive with AT&T. He's successful. They both have their homes. They both have their kids. My daughter is living the bohemian LA comic life. She's a, she received her, um, all of them went to college. She is a uh, art historian lecturer. So she makes money for me from that. But she works as an LA comic and uh, she also published a collection of her series of her essays. And so there's two authors in the family. And uh, yeah, we, we, all love and, we all love and enjoy each other's company. Of course, we tease each other a lot and we joke a lot. But uh, when it comes to the book, I don't feel the need to be um, vindicated or validated. That, that's the better word. I don't need to be validated by my kids reading the book saying, oh, good job, Pops, we're happy for you. But, they, but we cheer on each other's successes, whatever they might be. And they're happy that this is helping other people. When I was working at a church, they, they didn't like coming to the church where I was at. They said, oh my gosh, we love listening to you teach. We love your lessons. We love your, your, your method of storytelling. But everybody, you know, it's like, oh, you're Octavio's kid. They were like living in this fishbowl. So they ended up going to churches where they could be a little bit more anonymous. So, yeah. Um, so another question kind of related to that is, did you draw criticism from your family when you wrote this book? No, no, because I told them that it, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, uh, I, I was fortunate. I, I had an assistant who worked for me and I gave her the first 30 pages as a treatment. And when she read it, she said, you know, I love your father because the way you, you speak of him and the way the story is going, you're this hero and your father's a monster. And I remember thinking, man, that is exactly what I don't want. So even though I share a lot of the negative stuff that happened that my dad did, including myself, I needed to humanize him and point out that he had his own bag of crap that he had to deal with as a small boy that he brought into all the relationships. He must have suffered different humiliations, uh, being an immigrant in a country where he didn't speak the language and maybe being cheated out of wages or who knows whatever, just, just because of not because of America, it's just how people are in, in general, you know, power can cause folks to take advantage of those without power. And he didn't have any real good coping mechanisms and uh, it blew out here and there, but um, no, no criticism because I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to portray myself as a victim. I was trying to portray the story as don't let this happen to you. You, you, what, regardless of whatever has happened, there's a way out, there's hope. And it, I, I'm convinced it's through forgiveness. I'm convinced of that. Whether it's a therapeutic process, whether it's a religious process, whether you seek it philosophically as a virtue, forgiveness from the mildest form, from the guy that cut, cut you off to the barista that got your coffee wrong to a great betrayal like adultery or assault, murder, um, it keeps you healthy and sane. Um, I have more questions for you about that, but we'll keep going with some of the chat. We can go offline later with those conversations. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you talk about forgiving your father, but I recall you saying that your mother also ignored you as a kid. And actually, if I recall correctly, she threw a hammer at you at one point. Is that correct? <laughs> she nailed me with a hammer. Yes. Yes. Um, did you ever come to forgiving her? Oh, yeah. That was, um, that was a long process. Boy, I think that... Yes, and it's in the book, but uh, briefly, um, yeah, the, my father's adultery when he left and went off with this other woman, that, that was like the huge, another big break in the family. And I think my brother and I sided with my dad because we still wanted and needed his approval, his recognition in our lives. My sister sided with my mother because of, you know, I think they were just women sticking together. And I, I do realize that may sound like a very flippant broad brush, but I'm just trying to put it into context. And my mother, I think had some jealousy towards my wife. And so she spoke ill of her. And I thought, well, I'm gonna show her, you know, you're not gonna, you're not allowed to see the kids. And so that she didn't see our grand, her grandkids for five years. And on the fluke, Christmas Eve, you know, you're all about forgiveness and being good and this, that, and the other. 
um, my sister took my kids to go see their grandmother. And by the way, my mother was always giving them gifts. She would send them through my sister or she would make handmade gifts, a little uh, slippers. She would knit them and or, or buy them things. And the thing that's, uh, <laughs> boy, hold on a second. During all this time though, my mother had collected all my memories, all these photos, the first 21 years of my life, the thought that I had lost them because I, you know, she had this collection of photos and newspaper clippings and little awards and ribbons that, um, that I had earned. And with no idea that she and her son would ever reconcile, she collected all that stuff, put it into a notebook and, uh, She instructed my sister to give it to me when she died. And uh, looking at it now off to the side over here. Um, yeah, I remember when I heard that she was, she went to, she, she started going to church in her late fifties. Um, I remember thinking cynically like, oh, that's just an old lady trying to get to heaven because she knew the shit she'd done, you know? But uh, what had happened, the same thing with my father, I realized, God, she had a shitty life, you know, and, and uh, she did the best she could of what she had. And um, so in the book, I, I talk about that moment. When I went to go visit her in the hospital, she had hip surgery and uh, she had asked, um, they had visited, you know, and I was getting ready to leave. And she asked it, you know, hey, had, did you ever forgive me? You know, I'm, I blew it. Did you ever forgive me? And I, I thought, oh, this poor old woman is sitting here regretting some, some of the worst moments of her life. And I said, of course, you know, of course I forgave you. You know, we're, we're good. Jeez, I'm so sorry that you didn't think I had, you know. And she said, could you just please tell me? And um, that's when she asked me just to verbalize the phrase, I forgive you. And uh, I recall thinking, I, I didn't understand that for years until I really, I let somebody down that really, really mattered to me. Actually, it was this, this, a person that worked for me and um, just really hurt her feelings and her husband. And um, some time had passed and we had reconciled. But I, I, I remember walking up to them after service one, one, one Sunday and I said, hey, you know, I, I know we're good, but could you just, I, did you forgive me? And they said, oh my gosh, yeah, we totally forgave you. We're good, you know, and they gave me this hug. And I, and I remember said to her, unplanned, just, just spontaneously it came out, you know, can you please just tell me, <clears throat> excuse me. And as I said in the book, I, I finally understood my mother that sometimes you just, um, you just need to hear it. So as far as forgiving, um, yeah, we were, we were good. She, I had a chance to tell her all the things that she did right, all the things she did well, and how much I appreciated all that she taught me. And I officiated her funeral. And so I'm one of those rare people in, in history that officiated both his parents' funeral. And uh, yeah, I, and I never thought I would be that man who would go visit his parents' grave, but I've had a couple of rough patches since she passed, just uncertain about what the future would hold, you know, leaving work, leaving this, doing that. And I remember I went up there and there was a, a strange measure of comfort knowing that I, in my thinking as a Christian, she's gone physically, but she didn't cease to exist. So yeah, I spoke with her just like you see in the movies. And it made sense. But I would, I would, prior to that, I would never have thought I would do that. So yeah, I guess you could say I did forgive her. <clears throat> well, we're, um, the time is flying, um, but we have one, uh, another question so far in the chat box that's from one of my writing students. So I'm, okay. I'm very happy that he asked this question. Um, would you say that writing was a good coping me mechanism or was it a good way to process some of your experiences? I wasn't looking for that. To be very honest with you, I um, there was a friend, the young woman who first reviewed the first 30 pages, she said that 
you should write this story down because I've heard you talk about it a few times and it really helped me deal with my dad and it might be beneficial to other people. Uh, I can't say no, it was therapeutic. I just, so that was one reason why I was encouraged to do so by this woman. The other reason is that there were times when in counseling or talking to people and encouraging them to forgive, inevitably, somebody would say, well, you don't know what it's like to suffer some, right? Because they just see you on your public face. And they see your home, you're married, you have kids, you're laughing like, oh my gosh, you must, you know, you have, you have no idea what it's like to suffer. I, you know, and I, I just, you don't want to play who had the hardest life. So I thought, if I encourage people to forgive and, and, and let them know that there's hope, I need to let them know that things weren't that great. So I, it was a bit of credentials. I, it was, yeah. I, if you read the book, you can't say, no, oh, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know? Someone once asked me, how long did it take you to write the book? I said, about nine months to write it, but 45, 50 years of research. So um, it wasn't therapeutic in that respect, though oddly, I've had a therapist friend tell me that she uses my book in dealing with some of her clients. And um, so that's it's good to hear. And this is what I meant earlier about, you know, you, you never know what good you will accomplish for the lives of other people that you'll never meet maybe doing something that as an act of service and, and, you know, did I want to tell people about my stuff? No, not necessarily. Am I embarrassed by it? Yeah, yes and no, you know. But if somebody else benefits from this book or from the idea of forgiveness and they pursue it and they, they, they become set free, I can't think of a better I can't think of a better ending to, or redemption for all that I went through than that. It would be worth it. So. So here's a big, maybe possibly our last question. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for us in these politically contentious times when we tend to focus on our political and other differences? How can we forgive people who we don't understand, who don't understand us, who we're so different from? Yeah. I, it's the same idea. Um, I, I've had to verbally say for some people in some situations, I forgive you. I release you. I bless you. And I love you. But that's mine. For some of you, you won't be able to say I love them. But I... I it, it, just, it just doesn't matter. I, I realize that it, it is very divisive. You still, it is still to your benefit to forgive them. Because, and I'll tell you why. Because you carry that shit into every relationship or organization. And you think, well, it's only that person that pisses me off. But it's still there. And so think of it as vomiting or diarrhea. You, know, you, you get that junk out. Is it pleasant? No. Would you, do you want to do it? No. Is it helpful? Yes. So we understand that in the physical realm, that if, if you're sick, you know, you t accidentally eat the wrong thing, the doctors will induce vomiting or, you know, they'll give you something to, to go to the restroom and eliminate that way. But when it comes to the invisible, emotional, mental, or spiritual process, we just think somehow there's some sort of magic that happens or you can ignore it. No, forgiveness is elimination. Forgiveness is eliminating what is waste and perhaps keeping what is good. Because even in a negative situation, you can learn from it. Um, but I would absolutely, that, that question is fantastic. I would absolutely encourage that, that, that asker of that question to forgive the other one that has a different opinion. And um, because uh, you will cloud potentially your thinking in the future and your judgment 
and it could affect your relationships and and i'm it is that serious those things do not go away they accumulate forgiveness is a way to like a steam valve releasing all that mess or you can keep the vomiting and diarrhea metaphor if you wish <laughs> thank you so much for leaving us with that you're welcome um, so we have um, two minutes left. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, would you like to raise your hand and say anything? Um, I think we can unmute you if, if you would like to do that or put it in the chat box. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess. I guess that's it. Um, thank you so much for, um, for meeting with us today on a Friday afternoon. And um, thank you to everyone who came on a Friday at, at the end of uh, week 10 of a 10 week term. Um, Allison says, um, just like to say thank you for being so open and sharing. She'll definitely read the book. This wasn't meant to be an advertisement, but um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, I appreciate yeah. that. Um, Anyone else before we? Um... You know what? Let, let me. There's somebody from Elizabeth Jones. She asked this question: Did compassion come first or forgiveness? Uh, compassion. Uh, it's not that it has to, but as I mentioned before, it's just the empathy of recognizing the other person as a human being, and who knows what what happened to them. And even that old corny phrase there, but by the grace of God, go I. So, uh, yeah. Okay, it looks like you can see the chat box. Do you see anything else that I missed? <laughs> uh, well, hang on a second. I will tell you right now. Yeah. Thank you. There was one person that said about something. I understand. Okay, I understand so many people think it's a competition when it comes to trauma and experience. People just think because they had a work experience that makes the other person's trauma is invalid. Yeah, that's true. Um, look, I, it's not a competition, but it's the same remedy forgiveness. And uh, I remember giving these talks in, in Europe, the one, one woman in, in, in Germany, she came up to me. She was in her late 50s. And uh, she heard the talk. And uh, she came up to me. She's and she this is this is horrible. Uh, she was when she was a little girl, both her mother and father, her parents would pimp her out to older men for sex. And of course, she had a lot of horrible baggage to carry. And she said, How do I forgive that? And we talked a bit, and but my first approach was um, to simply point out that as hard as it might be, what she was carrying for the last few decades was just as hard. So pick your hard. Look, going on a diet is hard. Uh, trying to get healthy is hard. Um, doing anything that is healthy is hard, but being uh, physically unfit is hard. Having a a bad marriage is hard. Having a good marriage is hard. I mean, pick your heart. Pick your heart. I, I, my suggestion is that if you're going to pick a heart, if you're going to have a heart, you might as well go ahead and, and do the hard work of forgiving so that you're free at the end of it. So that, that would be my final word. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thank you again to everyone who's been here. Um, stay tuned for other arts and culture events coming up um, in the winter and the spring and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.